Okay, so I want to welcome every location from around the world right now. Uh, you're joining us, as you can see, in a different location. Uh, we're not in our normal place because we have had adverse weather conditions in the UK. Uh, it's quite remarkable, and because of that, we're in our chapel setting where we actually meet in the evenings. And uh, this is our chapel set, and it's very beautiful. It's an amazing building. I think what this goes to show is that we can meet anywhere as the church. <laughs> You know, we, we haven't got an issue with stained glass, and we haven't got an issue with a warehouse, and we haven't got an issue with a cow shed. I'll tell you what, we, we're going to meet wherever God calls us to meet, and there God is in the middle. So you're so welcome to join us right now. And we're going to do our best to give uh, a message to you today that is going to be life-changing. You've joined us in the Remember series, part three, and this is where we're just remembering who God has called us to be. Because all through scripture, you will see that we sort of start off knowing who we are, but we very easily through life, we forget who we are. And what we choose to remember and what we choose to forget has a massive impact on where we go. And that is why many people struggle within their marriage and relationships, because they end up getting into a place where they forgot their first love. So there's something about remembering that gratitude, appreciation, that first love. It's like, I've got to remember I remember what it was like when I first met you. I've got to remember. There's something about remembering. I believe that God wants to set some people free through this message today, that his word has the power to break people free. And so I'm going to use a story. We're going to go straight into scripture here from Exodus chapter 5. And this is a famous bit of scripture to do with Moses. And it's all about Moses who was, uh, you know, he'd been in the wilderness for many years and he'd been called by God to come and lead people, were to negotiate the freedom of the biggest bunch of slaves there's ever been. So they, there was like millions of them, over two million slaves, and it's like, Moses, you're the man for the job, you are my negotiator, God said. You're like the freedom negotiator. And he had a bit of an argument with God and said, I don't think it's me, I don't feel qualified. And he said, no, you're called, that's why you're qualified. And so from here, he comes in, and uh, 400 years they've been in this prison. So uh, these, you know, the people of God, they've been in the prison under the Egyptians for 400 years. That's a long time. They couldn't remember really, they couldn't remember what it was like to be really, really free. And so here they were, and we're going to pick up this story where um, Moses goes to, he, he ends up going to Pharaoh and he said, you know what, you need to let God's people go. So he worked up his great speech and he said, you need to let, my, you know, God's people go. And then Moses said, you got to be kidding. You're having a laugh, he said. And that's what Pharaoh said. He said, instead of that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it more difficult for you. And I just want to introduce Boris the Brick. <laughs> no, this is a brick. <laughs> and uh, I know it's an unusual brick. But uh, th this is a brick. And I want to talk about bricks. This is the, the brick preach. And because what Pharaoh did was, you see, he said to Moses, he said, do you know what? I'm really annoyed that you think that you can walk out of here, that you can have a prison break. Even, even through this message now, the enemy doesn't want you to have a prison break. And he'll get angry with that and he'll try and discourage you. And what he did was the Israelites, they were making bricks. That was their job. They made bricks. They were building cities. They were making bricks. And if you know anything about making bricks, and I've seen them do this in Kampala, is that they get clay, they cut clay out of the earth, and then they mix that clay with straw. And the straw, what does it do? It binds the clay so it makes them strong, so when they're being built with, they don't break. So straw is like an, it's, it's, it's an incredible ingredient to make this great brick. And maybe the, these are the people that are in slavery. So just think of Boris here the brick. He's here. And up till now, they'd always had straw. But what happened was, is Pharaoh said, Pharaoh said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to make you make bricks without straw. And this is where we pick up the scripture in Exodus 5, verse 15 to 21. Then the Israelite overseers went and appealed to Pharaoh why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told, make bricks. 
Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are. You are lazy. This is why you keep saying, let's go and sacrifice to the Lord. Isn't that interesting? What they were doing is they wanted to go and worship the Lord. And through their work, Pharaoh was causing more distraction to prevent them going to the house of the Lord. When you draw close to God, the enemy will cause more distraction in your life to prevent you from drawing close to who God is. And here he is. He says, now get to work. You will not be given any straw. Fancy that. So I'm going to make your life difficult. I mean, they're, they're slaves already. It's like you're either like a slave that is like life's okay, being a slave, or life is really, really difficult. This is the difficult bit. Yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. The Israelite overseers realized they were in trouble. I bet they did. When they were told you are not to reduce, though, the number of bricks required of you for each day. And when they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. So Moses had been and said, let my people go. He worked up the confidence. I'm, I'm called. Let me go. It's all going to work out. And then suddenly the whole situation seems to get worse. And so they come and they meet Moses and Aaron. And they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Oh, is this the Egyptians speaking to Moses and Aaron? No, it's their own people. Moses has come as the negotiator for freedom. And from it, because they have trouble, every day they have to make bricks, the same number of bricks, which basically is near on impossible, they get mad with those that are leading them. And that's where they end up in this place of what has happened. We thought we were on our way out for freedom. We're all up for freedom, aren't we? I'm sure everyone listening to this message is, I want to live a life of freedom. I want to live a life that is free. I want to be free from fear, from anxiety. I want to be free from depression, from, you know, all these things. Self, like intimidation, all these. I want to be free. I want to live a life of freedom. But sometimes you've got to go through the storm. Every promised land has a wilderness to go through. And the wilderness isn't just somewhere you walk through, it's a test. So this is what I want to share with you. You've got to get this, guys, right? This is a big, big point. Are you ready? Are you ready? Here it is. God will allow trouble to create movement. So right now, I want you to realize that there is freedom that God wants for his people. Done deal. He, he is like, I, I want my people to be free. That is God's plan for his people. It's his plan for you. But we haven't always been told that in going after freedom, God will use trouble. That means that God will allow trouble right here. It's like, go and you know, go to Pharaoh and he's going to be so fearful because we'd all pray that prayer. Come on, we'd be in the prayer meetings going, yeah, when Moses turns up, he's like going to fall on his knees and he's going to say, Moses, you're right and I'm so scared of your God and you better all go right now. He doesn't. He says, I'm going to make life difficult for you. Who identifies with that? It's like there is something about, I prayed that prayer to God Almighty, the creator of the universe, in Jesus' name and I said it seven times. And then what happens is it just feels like trouble comes along. One thing that God wants to do is cause movement in your life. It's, it's massive. He's actually more interested in movement in your life than comfort. He's actually more interested in movement than security and safety. But we sometimes preach as Christians, you come to Jesus and your life will just be happy. You come to Jesus, you're going to probably find some trouble. But there's a promise on the other side of the trouble. And you see, they thought it was all going to be a done deal, but they used to being in slavery. And slavery teaches you to sort of behave. Slavery teaches you not to ask questions. And when there's trouble, you better get back in your hole. 
and even right now, God is saying, come on, you need it. If you want this, if you want to get free, you've got to realize the trouble could be part of the course. God will use trouble. I, I can't explain this. See, this is one of those messages that not everyone's going to go, oh, great, I just love that message. Because it's like, I'm here, I'm here right now to preach that sometimes the trouble in your life is exactly what God has allowed to cause you to move because you settled. Because what happens is, is sometimes when we settle, when we settle, even settling becomes a prison for us. They'd settled for 400 years. Did they have, did they have like their food taken care of and their clothes and everything they needed? They all had jobs. They all carried on through routine. See, trouble has a habit of creating an upset. And we always think, God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? I'm sure that those Israelites were saying, God, why have you allowed us to have to make these bricks without straw? We're your people. And God is all the time saying, oh, yeah, I'm allowing it. Because it's more important for me to see you move than to see you settle. We want to settle, but God wants to move us. I'm speaking to some people right now who have settled, and maybe you settled in your faith. Maybe you settled just where you are, in the place you live. Maybe you settled in uh, the job you are, maybe in the relationship you are. And I'm talking about an unhealthy relationship. Maybe you're in a church that really is dying, and your family is dying. And you're there to the end. And God is causing trouble to cause you to move. He will use trouble. God will allow trouble to create movement. But can I ask you this question? Are you willing to be led through trouble? Because Moses is there, and we all know the end of the story. So it's like this amazing thing that he's there and he's saying... Hey, okay, we're going to go through a bit of a bad patch. We're going to have a few like plagues and things and threats and lots of bricks. And we're going to get whipped a lot more because it says they beat them and beat them. I mean, this is hardcore stuff. They beat them. And uh, from it, it's like we know the end of the story. But at the time, immediately, as soon as Moses, you know, as, as soon as they saw Moses, they said, you have made us a stench. You've made us obnoxious. Basically, we're not happy in following you. God may have made you the leader, but we don't like the deal. And I want to put it right now that some people here today, listen to this message, you are still in prison because you're not willing to, lead, uh, to actually follow those that are leading. It's like, really, that's for someone right now. You're still in prison right now because you're not actually willing to follow those that are leading you that want to lead you out of captivity. You may be suspicious. You may be unwilling to yield. You may just have a bit of a, an issue around, oh, how, how do these things work? I'm going to stay in my own corner. You're staying in your own prison. And it says clearly here that God, God, he doesn't look and respect that independence. He said, I want you to move. I want you to move now. I want you to move. See, when slavery becomes normal, freedom become, becomes uncomfortable. So you think for 400 years, for 400 years, they were used to slavery. Suddenly, they're feeling like they're complaining. They've got an issue. They're complaining because it's a hard time getting to freedom. Because they got comfortable with slavery. Sometimes I meet people who are actually comfortable in their own anxiety. I meet people who are actually comfortable in feeling a rubbish way about themselves, but they've just grown to get used to it. I've met people who are treated terribly in relationship and have got no self-respect and they get abused. The slavery has become normal. I've seen people who are in depression that are quite happy to stay there and they don't want to fight to get through it because they got used to their slavery. And God wants to change the way we... He wants to set us free from this. You see, friends will always... Friends are great, but friends will normally cause agreement for you. 
you know, it's like I'm going to speak to my, you know, when, when you're going through a tough time, you want to speak to someone that's going to tell you normally what you're doing is the best thing ever. And even if your attitude stinks, they're going to be going, oh, well, I understand. Yeah, it must be tough. I didn't think they had the right to like, talk to you like that. We friends often agree with us. We, we surround ourselves with people that will actually agree with us so we feel better about ourselves and we can stay in prison. The enemy causes resistance and rejection. But he will give you your greatest prize. It's not your friends that will give you your greatest prize, it's your enemy. David and Goliath. He had a king, he had brothers, he had an army, none of them gave him the prize. Who gave him the prize and the opportunity of the day? It was through resistance and ridicule he steps up to the mark and in the point of trouble he receives the greatest prize. It was actually his enemy that gives him the greatest prize. Even right now, who you think is in control of your world is actually in the hands of God. And there is something about understanding that when you, when you feel intimidated by the enemy, I've seen this, he always oversteps his mark. He always goes too far. He tries to take something from you and he tries to take provision. He tries to bring in sickness and ill health and he wants to rob you of trust. And he comes in, but do you know what? He goes too far. And what? You start believing. You start coming to a level of faith like you've never been before. Suddenly you start realizing you've got a pair of fists and you can fight as a Christian. And it's called prayer. It's called prayer. And you get on your knees and you start praying. Do you know when it happens? When you normally face trouble. Your enemy will cause you and give you the greatest prize. We need to stop whinging about it and get on with the fight. We need to stop complaining about it, spending all our time focusing on the resistance rather than focusing on the movement that's taking place. Come on. Ooh. So, Exodus 5, 22 to 23. Moses went back to God and said... My master, why are you treating this people so badly? And why did you ever send me? This is Moses. It's like, he's had trouble. What does he do? He goes back to the boss. He's like, you sent me to set them free. They're all unhappy. I'm the worst, like, you know, negotiator ever. I am qualified, but it doesn't feel good right now. From the moment I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, things have only gotten worse for this people and rescue does this look like rescue to you? How many of us have prayed that prayer? We're praying prayers right now, and you have said this. You've said in your head, things have just gone from bad to worse. God has given you something to go after. Maybe it's a promise. Maybe it's a loved one. Maybe it's a situation. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's something, and it just goes from bad to worse. And from it, you think, hey, what does even rescue look like? Poor old me, Moses. I was happy with the sheep and here I am now. There's a bunch of people that are miserable. It's gone from bad to worse. Because we say these things. And do you know what? The enemy wants to use it to get you back in your hole, back in your prison, to make you think that when you pray and when you declare his promises, they're not going to make any difference. But see, God all the time is causing movement and movement and momentum with Moses. And he's saying, come on, Moses, put yourself together. This is all part of it. I'm actually, I'm resisting on purpose. And this is why we can learn so much. See, God knows we need more than just a good prayer or a good word over us or a good podcast or preach he actually knows we need resistance to cause us to be moved so he will use trouble in your life he will use trouble he will allow trouble because he's more interested in moving you I am sure that the Israelites spent a lot of time praying at this point they all got together they had big prayer meetings every night saying help us make the quota of bricks tomorrow there they're praying. 
I'm sure they were reading all the old promises. They were there going through. But you know what they needed to do is they needed to be willing to move. The whole key is they need to be willing to move and do something, not just pray a prayer. And church, we pray, we pray and that is wonderful, right? It's great, but we also got to move. We got to move. We're waiting for someone else to move for us. We're waiting for someone else to say a prayer that will magically move us from here to there. But God is saying, no, I'm going to cause trouble and resistance to cause you because resistance causes friction. It causes pressure and it causes you to move. See, they had a 400-year habit of slave thinking. Some of you have got a 21-year-old habit of slave thinking. Some of you a 46-year-old habit of slave thinking, and so on, so on. And what happens is, is we just get used to, see, we become what we learn. And what happens is it just becomes normal. And we just continue. So for 400 years, they just did what they were told. They were in captivity. And it's like, that's the way we are. We think in a slave-like manner. And I think even for some of us, we have a slave-type thinking around religion. That we think it's by works that we are saved. And as long as we can be a good person and keep helping enough people, we're going to feel better by, uh, about ourselves. When that will never be enough. It is only by accepting that you're unconditionally loved and forgiven by Jesus that you will get that. There's no other way that it's not through our works. There's nothing we can do but all because of him. Yeah. But do you know what I mean? There, there are these like prisons, these ways of thinking, like failure. Many people are trapped in failure for many years. And they, they sort of stay in that place. And God is using resistance sometimes to use more trouble through, in, through failure until you realize you've got to move out of failure. Some, sometimes we have the same habits we get stuck in that we're in this prison and we wonder why we're going from trouble to trouble on a cycle that keeps continuing and we wonder why does it keep happening because God is saying don't you settle I'm going to keep giving you a challenge until you wake up and say I don't want to stay here anymore and some of us are back here again in this place maybe you're in church tonight maybe you're in church this morning whatever, whatever time it is I'll tell you what God is speaking to someone and saying, I don't want you to stay in the pattern of slavery. I want you to break out, but you've got to change the pattern. You've got to change the pattern. Some of us got stuck in a job situation that actually ended up really costing so much of our life, more than God intended. Some of the stuff in our life become, it became slavery to us because we got stuck because we know the more we have, the more we get attached to. And you see, all these things, these ways of thinking, they're like vertical bars. And what they do is they spell prison. They form this prison. See, bricks without straw is God's way of creating this one amazing thing. You know what it is? Bricks without straw is God's way of creating willingness. 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 You don't want someone in a marriage who is just obedient. I will love and obey you. You want someone who's willing to go to the end of the earth for you. You don't want your children just to, you will do as I say. You want them to understand willingness. Willingness. Do you think God in the same way? Willingness is such a powerful word. See, we understand obedience but when you understand willingness, it's far bigger. Willingness will take you further than you've ever gone before. Willingness is something that will say, well, I don't have to, but I'm willing. <laughs> it's like I could settle here right now, and actually it would be okay. You know, I'm a believer. I came, you know, I put my faith in Jesus. I'm sort of, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm doing okay. Willingness takes you to places of freedom you could never imagine. Willingness. It's God's idea. See, he's, I believe that God was saying, do you know what? We're, we're going to cause a situation here. The angels, he's saying, we're going to cause a situation. Uh, we're going to sort of uh, get, you know, they think they're going to go because Moses is going to go and do the job for them. But they're not actually willing to leave. They're too comfortable in the place they got to. And if they leave right now just because I make the situation happen, they're going to leave... And they're not going to understand what willingness is about. 
willingness, we got to understand how powerful this is. So God not only wants to get you out of Egypt, but to get Egypt out of you. There's something, see, we, we know that for many people I'm speaking to, you came and you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal savior. You walked into freedom, right? You walked into the place, you were made free. You're, it's like when they walked out of Egypt, they were free, but then they had to go on the journey. So there's something, see, he wants to get Egypt out of you today. And I'm speaking to some people, right, who is like, yeah, I'm, perhaps I have got a faith or I'm a believer, but you can't say you're free. And his plan is to use trouble and resistance to get Egypt out of you. 400 years of thinking, 21 years of thinking, 46 years of thinking. He wants to get that slave type thinking because you've only grown to accept that, well, that's just, you know, I've always been that way and it's the way my father was. And he's saying, no, I want to set you free. I want to bring freedom. I want to bring freedom. So we know that it went from bad to worse. And uh, they had all these plagues. They had the frogs, the gnats, the boils, the hail, the locusts, the death finally came. And uh, you got this whole idea that God and Pharaoh were having this battle. God and Pharaoh were having like this battle. It was almost like, hey, well, you know, he, Moses keeps coming back and says, let my people go. No, and then there's another plague. Let my people go this time. No, and there's another plague. It gets worse and worse. See? And this, this is the fascinating thing, is this scripture here, Exodus 7.3, it actually says that God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Oh, so was Pharaoh having a standoff with God? No, Pharaoh was in the hand of God. That's what I'm saying to you. Sometimes the person you think is causing you the biggest trouble in your life is actually perhaps only in the hands of God. Maybe he's going to cause some resistance and challenge to your life because he wants to cause you to move from where you are rather than actually stay still and get stagnant and complacent. And we'll find this hard that somehow God hardened Pharaoh's heart right through to the end. What is he doing all this time? He's creating willingness in the people of God. He will create a willingness in you. And he's saying to you right now, he wants to create willingness. No one can make you willing, only you can be willing. Someone can tell you what you should do and you do it out of duty, but when you're willing, when you're willing. And God is saying, I want you to be willing to walk into freedom. I want you to be willing. Because if you're not willing now, you're not gonna fight for freedom. See, so often we focus on resistance rather than the willingness to move. Resistance is the interruption of complacency. And maybe the trouble in your life right now, and there's some situations, the trouble in your life right now, maybe God is allowing it because you settled. Maybe you just accepted. And I, I can think back to when, you know, years ago as a young married father and we didn't have much at all when I was made redundant. And it was like the end of the world. I thought, what am I going to do? Now later on, God knew exactly what he was doing. He had me in a situation where he created opportunity. And he said, you're going to wake up and start being the man I called you to be or you're going to whimper in the corner. And there are, there's things where we complain and we, we just think, oh, well, what's happened? It's gone from bad to worse. Resistance is the interruption of complacency and complacency will rob you of your promise. Complacency will cause you to settle another hundred years in slavery and say, at least we're getting food. If you're living a life that does not need faith right now, then you sold your faith life cheap. See, when you choose to go on a journey where it costs you and there is resistance and there is difficulty, you're gonna need all the faith you can get. But if you wanna retreat into a place that there's no risk and no storm, you've probably sold your faith life cheap. And I know I'm speaking to some people that went for that job. 
or maybe they got finished and they never got that job. And you were so disappointed, you thought, God, that was the perfect job for me. And yet God knew better. God knew if you got in that job, you were going to settle. Do you know what? If you got in that job, there's something that was going to go on there that would be unhealthy for you. Do you know what? I know. I know. I'm going to cause resistance. Resistance. Some of us have asked, why, why haven't I got that boyfriend yet? Why haven't I got that girlfriend? It's because you prayed, God, I want your best. <laughs> you prayed and you said, God, I'm willing to wait. God, I'm willing to trust you. And it's like you see other people who almost seem to be having answered prayer, but they didn't pray the prayers you prayed. There are things that you prayed that God is hearing. He said, oh, I've got the best lined up for you. Don't you settle for second best. Don't you settle for it because you should just see where you're going to go. You should see what's going to happen on the end of your decision. But I would use rejection and resistance. See, we got this all wrong that we just think that all the, this stuff of resistance and difficulty and trials is somehow, oh, it's, we're losing the battle. No, we're even winning when it looks like we're failing. Oh, oh. Lord, why didn't you answer my prayers? I prayed for healing. It never happened. I prayed for my family. It hasn't happened yet. But all the time, do you know what? If God had just answered the first time, maybe you would have just not understood what it is to put your trust in the living God. Maybe you're not, you, you didn't really understand what it was to be patient and trust and to press through. And God's building a character in you that only comes through trials. So you need to realize, guys, there are many things that you prayed about, right? That you had tears over. You spent sleepless nights over because it didn't come through the way you wanted. But today you're rejoicing that it never happened. Because we only see part of it and we think, God, give it me. God, send me. Do this. Do this. Why did I get rejected? Why did that happen? Why didn't it come through? But do you know what? Later on, I've discovered, I start seeing, I go, oh, that's why. And I've come to learn, and I want to encourage every one of you, that you might not understand. You don't need to understand. You just need to trust who God is. And you just need to say, God, I understand that, and I'm going to pray for it. I'm going to ask for it, but ultimately, I trust you. Do you know what? If you can actually harden the heart of Pharaoh, and you're going to use resistance to create willingness in the people of God, create willingness in me, Lord. And if it means there's some no's that are coming that are painful, I'm going to continue trusting you, because you are my God, and you are my Father. Why? Because your rejection is your direction. Your rejection is your direction. When you get rejected next, just think of this saying. You just need to say, okay, okay. I was hoping I'd come through. I feel a bit gutted and I pick myself up. But do you know what? I remember. I remember. In scripture, all of the time, you see rejection is your direction. See, this is what God can do. And if you came into this message and somehow you're feeling, I don't know, I'm not really getting th through, I'm not seeing progress, and you, you're going through some battles and storms right now, remember, your rejection is your direction. So good. So either we're going to feel um, sorry for ourselves in this, and this is where, this is, actually, this is what happened to uh, most of the Israelites, is they mumbled, grumbled, complained, or we were better off in Egypt. Come on, some of us do that. We follow Jesus. We live an incredible life. And then we're there mumbling and complaining. Gratitude, incredible message from last week. You've got to get it. It's life-changing. Or what we do is we choose joy. We choose joy. And this is linked to gratitude. Here is James 1, 2 to 4. Consider it then pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith, it produces perseverance. There's something here. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That is God's plan for every one of you. So you've got a choice. We'll all face the trials. Resistance, rejection will come, but you can choose joy in the middle of rejection. You can choose to smile and have a laugh when everything looks like it's going wrong. It's just gone for bad or worse. I often say this to Heather. Maybe, yeah, do you know what I'm today? Yeah, things have just gone from bad to worse. Let's just have a laugh. And we laugh together 
because what we're doing is we're laughing at the enemy who wants to intimidate and we're saying you think that we're going to be somehow we're going to be there all, all night talking over what we're going to do it hasn't worked and what we all these people and that, that's going to happen and, and oh, we haven't got an answer to this we say no going to remember that you're a good good god you love your children you've called us you're faithful and even if it means trouble knocks on our door every day I just know that trouble causes movement. That means I'm not stagnant. That means I'm not dead. Come on, church. We need this. We need this in our life. So, <laughs> so to finish, you will never access God's best. You will never access God's best unless you are willing to move. Only you can move move only you can move so these are the three things God uses trouble to move you maybe you need to stop praying for a breakthrough or stop praying just to make more bricks and get the heck out of there you're praying just to get through the situation where God's saying no I want you to move what situation are you in that you're just praying the same prayers that God's saying no move and last one choose joy because do you know what joy comes from? An unspeakable confidence. That's why we smile and we laugh, because we know something. We know something. It's time to move, church. It's time to move, church. And I want to challenge everyone that's listening right now. You've got to keep moving. See resistance. See the trial. See the storm. It's moving. Some of you have come through trial. And you think, what was all that about? It's because God had an agenda to move you and grow you towards the promise. And you can ignore this message and stay in your prison. Do you know what? That is your choice. But I'm cheering you on today saying, do you know what? It's time to move. And we are going to see incredible things happen. This all comes from remember. Remember, church, who you are. Remember who we're called to be. Remember not to settle. Remember to go after God's best. Thank you, church, for joining me. God bless you.